यस मैम हेलो मैम थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर ओके आई एम हिबा फरीन एंड दिस ऑनलाइन वीडियो हैज बीन इनिशिएटेड बाय ओडिशा स्टेट ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड वुड लाइक टू थैंक द टेक्निकल टीम फॉर हैविंग टेकन दिस इनिशिएटिव फॉर लॉन्चिंग एन ऑनलाइन प्रोग्राम सो टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट अ सेशन ऑन इंडियन राइटिंग इन इंग्लिश पोइट्स नेम सरोजनी नायडू her poem the bangal seller so before starting the session i would like to introduce you people about who ms who sarojini naidu was and and what was her contribution in the in the freedom struggle and her literary work that she wrote what was the inspiration behind writing those things so first of all we need to start with who ms sarojini naidu was so her full name was sarojini naidu chatopadhyay who was born on feb February 13 1879 in Hyderabad India and died on March 2nd 1949 in Lucknow she was a political activist she was a feminist and she was a poet and she was the first indian woman to be the president of indian national congress and she was called as nightingale of india uh, she had uh, some sort of experience in uh, suffragist campaign in england and uh, she was drawn to indian national congress movement and she was even participated in mahatma gandhi's non cooperation movement as well and uh, she traveled in uh, eastern africa and uh, south africa uh, for the indian people and she worked for the indian women in particular as being the president of the national congress and um, and having been presided 8 years earlier by the english feminist annie besant so she went to north america she lectured on the english congress movement in 1928 and 29 she came back in india and her views was anti british anti britishers and her activity brought about a number of prison prison sentences and she accompanied gandhi to london for the inconclusive second session of the round table conference as well and uh, she had a indian british cooperation in 1931 and there was a outbreak of world war 2 and in which she supported the congress party policies just first of aloofness and then of the avowed hindrance to the allied cause so there are different works that she wrote her literary life i would like to highlight on she was an active literary she had an active literary life and uh, had a uh, notable in the indian intellectuals uh to her famous salon in bombay so her first volume of poetry was a golden threshold that was written in 1905 and that was followed by the bird of time that was written in 1912 and in 1914 she was uh, elected as a fellow of the royal society of literature and her collected poems all of which she wrote in english have been published under the title the sceptered flute in 1928 and the feature of the john in 1961 so this is all about uh, ms sarojini naidu now we will be focusing on what is this poem all about what the title suggest first of all we need to read the poem and then we will be getting to understand some of the lines and then we will form a tell uh, on what's the technique behind writing all the poem okay so first let's recite the poem the bangle seller bangle sellers are we who bear our shining loads to the temple fair who will buy these delicate bright rainbow tinted circles of light lustrous token of radiant lives for happy daughters and happy wives some are meet for a maiden rest silver and blue as a mountain mist some are flushed like the birds that dream on the tranquil bow of a woodland stream some are a glow with the bloom that cleaves to the limpid glory of newborn leaves some are like fields of sunlit corn meet for a bride on a bridal morn some like the flame of her marriage fire or rich with the hue of her heart's desire tinkling luminous tender and clear like her bridal laughter and bridal tear some are purple and gold flecked gray for she has journeyed through life midday whose hands have cherished whose love has blessed 
and cradle fair sons on her faithful breast and serves her household in fruitful pride and worships the god at her husband's side so this is the poem that i recited so after reading this poem so we can say that how the poems begin with a temple like setting okay and the different lines that we read how can we try to relate this poem to the present scenario that would be quite a challenging way because in this poem we hear some of the lines about the sun and how the women are so let's get so let's start the poem so this um, poem was uh, written by ms sarojini naidu who is a nightingale of india in this poem she tries to portray a vivid picture of the common life okay so and this bengal seller is not an exception uh, she has written innumerable works such as indian weavers in the bazaars of the hyderabad kurumandal fish fishers all these deal with the life of the bengal sellers in her poem so initially uh, in bengal seller we will be seeing that how the pictorial quality of her poetic creation portrayed various stages of women lives from her very childhood to death and there are series of imageries and symbols that tries to inculcate in the minds of the readers to connect the various colors of the bangles with different stages of women's life span and so she refers to the bangle seller she narrated there as a labor to bear the shining loads of bangles to the temple fair they know that it is an easy spot to locate women of every age there so uh, so the first plan first line of the poem as he says the naidu here tries to gives an analysis like the bangle seller are we who bear our shining loads to the temple fair so here he is trying to analyze give an analysis of the bangles as being delicate bright rainbow tinted color of lights bangle sellers are as if scattering the seven colors of the rainbow of joy through their calls they are selling the bangles to the prospective buyers then they are saying that who will buy these delicate bright rainbow tinted colors of light so she is saying about the lustrous radiant tokens of lights about the bangle and how they are the sort of bringing happiness and laughter in the lives of the joyous wives and the joyous daughter that is the women of all age then the line lustrous tokens of radiant lives for happy daughters and happy wives she is mentioning that the bangles being of lustrous tokens of the women's life she is indulgent in the concern of the projection of different stages of women from the early childhood the circles of the light that's uh, showing the symbol of the women's total life span and in the second uh, stanza she uses the imagery in which women describe some of the bangles as blue and silvery and here she compared it to the mount landscape of the mountain mist she says that such bangles are for the maiden's rest and this metaphorically symbolizes the purity chastity of maiden that is the unmarried girl with the blue and the silver bangles then she in the lines of the poems i like i would like to quote that uh, some are meet for a maiden's rest silver and blue as a mountain mist uh, some bangles that she okay so some are flushed like the birds that dream on the tranquil brow of a woodland stream some are aglow with the bloom that cleaves through the limpid glory of a uh, newborn leaves so flushed red in color like a newborn bird that hang on the brows of the woodland stream and some of the bangles are there which are colored in bright light green just as it being of a newborn leaf so all these colors symbolizes the joyful status of the prime of youth in early maiden's life and some of them are the flame of her marriage fire or with or rich with the hue of her heart's desire so the, the different color representation that's the trying to show the different stages the different level of the happiness that the that the women have in her life so uh, the poet uh, describes the bangles the color with a rich yellow like the fields of the sunlit corn and these bangles are of bangles being depicted by the bengal seller depicts the different stages of the women's life uh then the tinkling luminous tender and clear like her bridal daughter and the bridal tear so uh, this says to show the umbilical relation that she had with her uh with her natural born parents and parents and how she will be leaving that house and going to the in-laws and uh, there was a laughter as she was as she has a sort of attachment with the umbilical relations and there's a sort of laugh tear because she will be leaving that and heading towards her in-laws uh 
she says that the purple purple is a color of pride and there's a royal living is associated with the color purple and women gain the uh, pride in her middle age after coming across to such crucial stage of life brideshood motherhood a woman who wears purple bangles has struggled her life midway through rearing children she also supported her husband as well as an entire family such a middle aged woman also wears bangle of gold flecked gray as a gray symbol as the wisdom and uh, maturity of her age so, so also she shows a victorious sustenance through the various difficulties of life is projected through the color of gold it marks maturity as well as that of motherhood so with this bangle cell can be associated with the celebration of the womanhood but being as a feminist we can say that how she can how the very lines the bearing of the sun and the very sort of mind mind can be seen that uh sun and the husband associations all that so so we can say that this uh so in the critical analysis uh, we can say that uh, this poem touches the realm of the women's life and it sets a fine example of musical verse and step by step every stages has been displayed and uh, and it seems to be a song of the men who sell glass bangles at village fairs and congregation or in temple towns and the different hues and bizarres is the different stages of women's life this may be be it a young maiden bride or the middle aged matron the color of each of the bangle is a symbolic portrayal of the state of mind as well so by reading the poem we can find that uh, uh, comprises this poem constitutes of four stanzas and uh, each stanza is of the six line each and each stanza is for the divided into a quatrain and a couplet and the rhymes being the rhyming scheme is a a b b c c um then and the reference that has been made to the bangle that is sparkling mm. in the sunlight that uh, the people have gathered in at the men at the temple ground at the different religious occasions and these hawkers of the pilgrims are trying to make a lucrative business out of it because they are getting customers lots of people would be visiting temples and they would be a sort of uh, and they they have making a lucrative decisions of attracting the people to their colorful chingling bangles and these colorful bangles were metaphorically used because it uh, tries to depict the different stages and uh, he calls out to women who might be interested in buying them attracting them by the rhetoric question while answering it himself in a most alluring tone he asserts that these bangles are lustrous tokens of radiant lives or happy daughters and happy wives and in the second stanza as we have read that bengal sellers call out saying that some of the bangles are for made in rest that uh, is used as a simile to depict their colors which are chiefly silver and blah, blah, blue uh, much like the mountain mist that is against um, simile that's or we, that's a simile mountain mist or or the alliterative sound that is produced uh, an embodiment of purity and these lines that talks about girls of their prime mainly focuses on maidenhood and hence at chastity the other bangles are rosy and shimmering that is a flush like buds that is a flower that blooms among the tranquil brow or the woodland streams so this is an imagery where the bangles are like into the pinkish flower sleeping sunken in a dream on the crest of plants near forest rivers so there are even some bangles exclusively meant for that um, glow with the uh, limpid there is a transparent glory akin to new born leaves going to the dew and water and the magic that a ray of sun conjures up in it uh, so we can say that this is a connotation to the new beginning and the promise of life to so the comparison of the bud and the new leaves to the young girls to pick that the colorful bangles for these maidens are uh, represent their playfulness and uh, liveliness the bangle seller claims to carry bangle is of women with uh, different needs and preferences in that uh, how the mangles like a field of uh, sunlit corn for women who are about to become a bride on her bridal morn so color chosen here is yellow a color uh, with that teams with life symbolic of hope 
that uh, she has for future and her felicity so imaginary used here is energetic lively with corn feel that is bath in sunlight um second part of this stanza portrays love a new bride has for her husband and to compare the color of the mangoes with the flame of her marriage fire referring to the holy fire that the couple go around and spell out this sacred mar marital vows um adhering to hindu ritual of marriage the flame can uh, also be seen as a euphemism for consummation of her marriage bangal uh, seem to be uh, tinted red with hue of heart desire and a surging feelings of love and passion for her husband or longing to love him to be loved in return thinking sound of the bangles their luminosity their fragility their and the pristine aura that they seem to have about uh, them are much like the bridal laughter and bridal tear on the day of her marriage bride is both joyous and anguished for on the one hand she looks forward to her life with her life partner but on the other hand she has to leave her leave her parental house a house which has her memories etched on its wall keeping in accordance with the hindu tradition and last time that talks about the pride of a woman who has come uh, past her girlhood bridehood motherhood and has earned a position as a matriarch she seems to have journeyed through life midways her hands has cherished the care that she could unconditionally bestow on her sons gently nurturing cradling uh, them on their faithful breast with the doting motherly love which knows the right blend of firmness and affection she has blessed her son and thus they have treaded the fair of righteous path in love thus um, it is a phase in her life where her um, diligent struggles have borne fruit and she sits with the complacency that is only natural to her age with an age of royalty and pride as to hit uh, these matrons wear bangles hued with purple and gold the specks of gray and maturity notwithstanding the silver years she runs her household in fruitful pride meticulously performing each task running the household with utmost uh, perfection which in turn gives her an inexplicable satisfaction and pleasure so she so sits at her aging husband's side as they seek divine blessing this is a symbolic of emotional support that a woman provides her husband with uh, till her last breath so this poem was composed in uh, post independence era when colonialism was taking its toll in the mind of the indians who were made to feel like second grade citizens cowering before the british rule not only did the indians lose their self esteem but also pride in their culture besides being a conscious poet sarodini naidu was a freedom fighter thus in an attempt to restore the pride of a countryman in its ancient and treasured culture uh, she was uh, she has painted the picture of an indian fair where the selling of bangles is quite a common sight so this is amalgamation of different colors of the shining glass bangles are as much a sight of beauty as they are a representation of what indian truly is diverse yet united uh, possessing a strength unparalleled at this the indians have all its stake it takes to rise against the british and sees the self respect and poem seems to serve as an impetus uh, apparently this poem seems to be a celebration of vivacity of indian culture to the presentation of its women in vivid colors and roles but to elit elud elucidations are but literal the this is a one poem that deserves a deeper thought for naidu writing was not just a form of art it was a medium of voicing her in a voice convictions that would fuel the nation towards a better future so naidu was an instrument was instrument in her encouragement of women empowerment to such an extent that even uh, that that even today it's a quite reliable subject that we will read and uh try to interpret in different ways try to relate it to the present situation so the poem which seems to question the very deserts of women which doesn't seem to acknowledge the independent identity of women an identity free from restricting labels proclaimed by patriarchal society it's actually an ironic takes on the lives of the women during her life so and choosing the setting of the temple is itself an evocative of how we entrust great importance to religion and we tend to neglect the other humane aspects of life upholding not the essence of religion but rather the idea of religion 
we still reside in country we still reside in a country that uh, marries off girl at a tender age depriving of her the rights of education and and there is a honor killing and uh, this there's still the cases of there's a rape or molestation still the women of our country are not safe whether it be the acid attacks or the very integrity of the women or the bodily presentation representation of the women the very taking the women as a commodity is still very prevalent in the current situation and still the women are facing those problems and they are subjected to torture and misuse so while talking about the women bearing children and she mentions that it's only the sons so it's a, it's an allusion to female feticide that was rampant in india at one point of time and it also reminds us how the daughters were denied the right to inherit filial property till one point of time so naidu has an empowering tone clearly comes to the surface when she doesn't hesitate to write about women's hard desire that she too has all the right to desire something which uh, would be seen as uh, quite a blasphemous thing if uttered in the days the the poem was set in but yeah she did utter this heart heart's desire that women too has a desire and she was quite vocal about it so while her other poems celebrate diversity in the country uh, this one disparages it as to some extent it goes on to speak about the poor and the rich and uh, somewhat addresses the issues of so this is how india works where multi story buildings snobbish stand against slums right so so thus i do uh, takes all the prevalent issues of her time of her time and only to break them down so by stupid rapping the fixed issue rules that are assigned to women she is being sarcastic in that way the bangal sala becomes a living reminder of the cringy lives of these women live it's perhaps an indirect an exhortation for them to rise above all of it to not let color of bangles define the kind of life that they are destined to live to pen down their own destiny right um, so this was the explanation but we are having a uh, much more detailed analysis that uh, how can we relate this poem with a different lens that uh, this was a feminine perspective that we are trying to Read this poem, right? Okay. So the theme, the I would like to now highlight on the theme of the poem. So generally, uh, the first theme, yeah, we can say it's about women, womanhood. According to the poet, uh, the life of an average Indian woman passes through three stages: maiden, bride, and as a mother. So each of these stages is described by the colors of the bangle. so the theme of the poem is that bangles are a part and parcel of women's life in india and each color represent the different stages in a life silver and blue or pink represent the stage of uh, maidenhood yellow is a morning of a wedding and the fiery red is a passionate longings in bride's heart symbolic of her bridal night and these are the representation of the girl's wedding and the gold and gray colors represent motherhood and matriarchy okay now we now the second uh, theme that i would like to say is patriarchy and that hasn't been directly referred to the role and domination of the male in the women's life yeah, but there are enough hints that can be seen in the poem a uh, man as a father as a husband and a son plays an important role in every stage of her life and the last four lines has been criticized as a tactic approval of patriarchal ideology by a women poet so uh, this was uh, uh like uh, whose hand has cherished whose love has blessed and cradled fair sons on her faithful breast and serves her household in fruitful pride and worships the god at her husband's side so by using uh, uh fair a uh, fair sons the poet has only upheld the gender discrimination in india indian families particularly uh the last lines too shows that women in subordinate position to her husband or even if the idea is quite factual or ironic um it only goes to favor a uh, setup in which women are mere objects to be placed in fixed boxes 
So, um, then uh, we will be I, then now we will be a pre critical appreciation of the poem can be like uh, uh, the, with the title of the poem is a bang, bangle seller and we expect to read this poem about the life of the bangle seller uh, but the poet refers obliquely to their lives in the first few lines of the poem only and we are told about the groups of the bangle sellers who are on the way to temple fair to sell their wares and they cannot be as happy as they have been described in life of poverty and deprivation uh, they can of course appear to be happy so except these two lines, we are told nothing of the bangle sellers, okay? And uh, the narrator, the one of the bangle sellers may be a man or woman. We have no clue about the gender, of, uh, gender, okay? So most probably the narrator is a woman and she only talks about the bangles of various colors and colors which are cherished by women in different stages of their growth. So the poem is about bangles, each colors which represent different stages of women and how she stay passes through different stages in her life so the title of the poem is quite is inapt it could have been a bangles or any other suitable title as it doesn't speak about the life of the bangles so it's totally speaking in a different way so how we take this poem it's 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 on our stride okay so there's no doubt that the bangles seller is quite simple evocative and lyrical and so them appeal to us at once and there's a quite captivating expressions like uh, rainbow tinted colors of light um, Lustrous tokens of radiant lives, tranquil brow of woodland stream. So, the, the, uh, how can we relate it to contemporary value? This poem being an evocative, having evocative parts, it doesn't appeal to modern readers. First, very few persons, at least in the urban areas, have ever seen the mango sellers. Okay, so some are very educated ladies, having little or no charm left for old-fashioned bangles. Moreover. Poets' uh, presentation of Indian scene and it was an orthodox, almost in lines with the outdated patriarchal ideology. Women who is represented as a tender, weak, helpless, dependent, and man as a father, husband, and son determines her life. So the image of proud mother rearing her fair sons, so it's no mention of daughters. And her uh, heart on place at the side of her husband at religious rituals is quite unacceptable in our times of feminist outlook. But the poem does have an appeal for old conservative and traditional people. It also has an appeal for those students of literature who has a love for literary expressions. So coming to the uh, style and literary devices, it's a lyrical form, poem in lyrical form. Uh, it is uh, remarkable for its verbal melody. It is short and gives expression to the single emotions or feeling of happiness. Like uh, any other good lyric, it is well-knit poem. It has a definite structure, four stanzas. And first stanza provides about the setting and introduction. And subsequently, stanza deals with the one important stage in stages of life in Indian women's life. And as we have told earlier, the rhyming scheme is A, A, B, B, and C, C. So it's a couplet form. And it's, may, it's responsible for melodious effect and fast rhythm. So now the deal now dealing with the imagery. Um, the the poet has used effective color imagery in the poem. For example, she chose the silver, blue, pink hues to represent maidenhood, yellow for bridal morning, and red or orange for bridal night as a representative of passionate longings in the heart of a bride, and purple and gold for motherhood to represent women's feeling of pride and fulfillment in her married life. So most of the images that comes from the world of nature, like flowers, leaves, birds, streams, sunlit corns, etc., have been used as comparisons. So this is quite unusual with the poets of Naidu's age, at least in the Indian context. The radical modern day imagery is missing in Naidu's poem and is perhaps unsuitable for her sensibility. So literary devices that we would like to highlight is um, simile. So she is quite fond of using simile in her poems. So the Bengal seller is no exception for pretty sure. In the second stanza, for instance, we have similes like silver and blues as the mountain mist. Sounds are flushed like the birds that dream. Uh, there are three similes in the third stanza. Um, some are like fields of sunlit corn. 
uh, some like flame of her marriage fire, like her bridal laughter and bridal tear. So this was a simile. Now we are heading towards metaphor. Metaphor is also in comparison, but they are more compressed and direct, and they are trying to relate two different things. So rainbow tinted colors of light is a metaphor for bangles. Then uh, shining loads, that's a metaphor for bundles of shining bangles. Then flush like the birds that dream is a metaphor for maiden lost in the dreams of marriage. And the last literary device that we are having is alliteration. Alliteration is the sound, that first word, how the, how the sound is particularly like, like uh, or rich with you of her heart desire sound is her. And whose hands have cherished, whose love has blessed. Here the sound is her again, hands have. Okay, so these are the two uh, alliteration that we are having in the poem. Now, um, after going through the critical analysis and seeing through the lens of the feminine, feminism aspect, dealing with the poem, how the current situation can be related to how the present situation of the women is, is also being highlighted. So this is all about uh, Bangal seller. So now can we take a, yeah. So now can we uh, start a different poem named uh, Joyanta Mahapatra's grandfather? Amit sir? Yes ma'am. Uh, this was for the first session. Today's session I think I am done with. So can we start the next poem that uh, was held for the previous day or the yesterday? Yesterday it was mentioned, but it wasn't able to. So can we continue that session in this program? Okay, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, your mic is uh, muted. Please unmute your mic. Yeah, right now I've muted it. I will unmute it. Okay, ma'am. Okay. What did the Baba say? Good morning, and Deva says good morning. Uh, so we can uh, can we discuss Patit sir regarding the poem? Good morning, good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning. Did you attend the session? Yeah, that uh, other one was cancelled. No students. We waited till eleven seventeen. Now here we are also not having any student, but we will be continuing it. At least it will be record recorded, na? Oh, it so will be recorded. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, what I didn't got you, sir. Please pardon. No, if, no, it's uh, recorded. I mean, uh, students can see the video afterwards. I'm telling. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that would be possible. And I was listening to Sarojini Naidu's poem. I think she celebrates femininity, isn't it? Yes. But the main yeah, she is trying to speak about the how the so uh, current situation that the women were having at the time and how it's quite relevant even today. How the patriarchal social patriarchal mindset is prevalent. Yeah, please but do add some of the views of yeah. yours. But she doesn't I mean uh, criticize uh, patriarchy per se, isn't it? On yes, reflect sir. what she thinks. Yeah, yeah, just she reflected upon it. Yeah. You can now switch over to this one, other one, grandfather mm -hmm. by then. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, sir.
are in. I mean, uh, what is the background? We also tell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can. I mean, what was the situation in India as well as in Odisha at that time, eighteen sixty-six? I think you must have read it. I mean, no need of telling you. Yes, yeah. none. You just you can start it. You can start the introduction. Like, uh, what was the situation, like the famine situation, and how the British has tried to compel the very Indians to as a proselytization I mean, to Christianity. Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, what should I say? I am including. I mean, because I am from other <laughs> faculty. Just I have some yeah, interest in English literature. So, hope you won't think that I am including or. intervening something like that no no it's not like that if you're in, if you want it it's quite welcome sir it's quite would be a interactive session okay i'm so when, okay, yes, sir. we'll talk about jain mahapatra's grandfather i mean i didn't tell about jain mahapatra because he will be telling only the background to his this grandfather point 1866 is a year where kalamati and food hunger came into the province of orissa at that time the commissioner of orissa was ravinsa you know ravinsa in whose name the ravinsa university afterward was established and at that time the governor was or viceroy was t lawrence t lawrence at that time didn't look to the problem of the people as such he was busy in I mean, organizing the celebration of Queen Victoria's Silver Jubilee in Delhi Darbar. So, Jayanta Mahapatra's grandfather, that yellow diary he got, and he wrote this poem, taking into account the situation at the time in Odisha. You know, ten, one million or ten lakh people perished in this famine. it was a famine which was one can say man made food was there but distribution was not there properly because in most of the famines in india the main problem is not shortage of food but its distribution and same thing happened in odisha also at that time people started eating also the leaves and all those things and as jant mahapatra has said there was a rustle of tamarind leaves in his empty belly i mean this hunger this pang of hunger forced in in a way grandfather of jain mahapatra to look into the missionaries who were distributing food and here the dilemma comes did he leave his old religion hinduism did he embrace christianity of course he embraced christianity but what was there in his heart of heart that nobody knows so taking into account all these things the grandfather poem was written and you can talk about its literary value all those things because i am novice i don't know much yes. about this in literature yeah, just given thank, thank you thank you very much sir thank you thanks a lot um so uh, we are heading towards jayanta mahapatra's um, grandfather so first of all we need to know who this personality was and who is he is alive okay so jayanta mahapatra is uh, one of the best known indian english poet and perhaps any discussion on indian english poetry would be incomplete without reference of his poetical poetical works he was a physicist he is a bilingual uh, he is a poet and an essayist and he holds a distinct position of being the first indian english poet having received the sahitya academy award that too in 1981 for his work relationship um in uh, 2009 he was awarded government he was awarded by government of india padma shri award and it was it's a country most prestigious award for civilian citizen for his outstanding contribution to the, to the field of literature so starting with his birth and early life where he was born and his early life what he was and all that so he was born on 22nd october 1928 in qatar he belonged to a lower middle class family and he had his earlier education at stewart school qatar after a first class master degree in physics he joined as a teacher in 1949 and he served in different government colleges of orissa and in later life uh, all his workings all his working life he was a physicist he was a physicist 
lecturer or professor at different colleges in Odisha, and he retired in 1986. And he had authored 18 books of poems, and he started writing poetry at the age of 38. So it was quite late by the normal standards for writing a poetry. But, and this was the reason, can we say, that it was uh, he brought a twist or a change in the writing pattern, and he was able to get it published in a in a in number of ways, okay, and quite with a hold over it. So Mahapatra's Mah twist with the muse came rather late in life. He published his early poems at the age of at the early age of forties. So his first first book of poem is um, Siavamra than the other poems in 1971, which is followed by the publication of the uh, Close the Sky, 10 by 10. So these are the collection of the poems. And it also includes the reign of rights, then um, life signs, whiteness of bone. Uh, one of Mahapatra's better remembered work is the long poem that is a relationship for which he even won the Sahitya Academy Award in 1981, as said earlier. So he's the first Indian English poet who is honored by this award and being one of the most popular Indian poets of his generation. And he uh, was also a part of the trio of poets who laid the foundation of a modern Indian English poetry. And he do, he do shared a special bond with Ikramanuja, one of the finest poets in the Indian English poetry tradition. Uh, Mahapatra is also different in not only being a product of Bombay School of Poets, over time he did manage to carve a quite tranquil poetic voice of his own, distinct, dif distinctly different from those of his contemporaries. And his worldly lyricism that is combined with authentic uh, Indian themes that put him in a league of his own. So his recent poetry volumes include The Shadow Space, Bare Face, Run and Distant. So besides poetry, he has experimented with Maharit forms of prose as well. And his lone published books of prose remains The Green Gardener, a collection of short stories even, a distinguished editor, uh, so Jayanta Mahapatra being, uh, bringing out for many years a literary magazine, Chandrabhaga, that is from, from Katha. So magazine is named after Chandrabhaga, a prominent but dried up river in uh, Odisha. And we now we can look about the, his vision of poetry, what is his vision. So to Odisha, to this land in which my roots lies and lies my past and in which lies my beginning and my end. He declared this in his uh, Award receiving speech of Sahitya Academy, this New Delhi. So the clue that we got to understand that Mah this Mahapatra's poetry is given by the poet himself. My poem deals with a life within myself where the mind tries to find a sort of coherence for the mass of things in the world. So this is quotation. Okay. So there are innumerable awards that he acclaimed and he was awarded. So there are innumerable works as well. So now we will be heading towards his poem. So first of all, we'll begin with the recitation of the poem by Jayanta Mahapatra. Okay. Grandfather, written by Joyanta Mahapatra. The yellow diary notes whisper in vernacular. They sound the forgotten posture, the cramped cry that forces me to hear that voice. Now I stumble back in your black page wake. No uneasy stir of cloud darken the white skies of your day. The silence of dust grace in lone afternoon sun, ruling the cracked fallow earth, ate into laughter of your flesh. For you, it was hard, hardest question of all, dead, empty trees, dressed stood by the dragging river, past your weakened body, flaying against your sleep. You thought of the way the jackals moved to move. Did you hear young tamarind leaves rustle in the cold, mean nights of your belly? Did you see your own death? Watch a tear at your cries, break them into fits of unnatural laughter. How old were you? Hunted you? Hunted. You turned coward and ran, the real animals in you plunging through your bones. You left your family behind, the buried things, the precious cloth, that praise quality of a god. The imperishable that swung your broken body, turned it inside out. What did faith matter? 
what hindu world so ancient and true for you to hold and easily you dreamt towards the center of your web the separate life let you survive while perhaps the one you left wept in the blur of your heart now in a night of sleep and taunting rain my son and i speak of that famine nameless as snow a conscience of yours is between us he is young the walls of glory are breaking down for him before me does he think of the past as a loss we have lived our own out of silence we look back now at what we do not know there is a dawn waiting beside us whose signs are a hundred odd years away from you grandfather you are an invisible piece on a board whose moves have made our children grow to know us carrying us deep where our voices lapse into silence we wish we knew you more we wish we knew what it was to be against dying to know the dignity that had to be earned dangerously your last chance that was blindly terrifying so unfair we wish we had not to wake up with our smiles in the middle of middle of some social order so this is all about the poem that he wrote so we can start with how the poem what does it mean and so the very lines the yellow diary notes whisper in vernacular they sound the forgotten posture the cramped cry that forces me to hear that voice so jayanta mahapatra's poem is a touching work a poem is almost autobiographical in nature as it deals with delicate topics of religious conversion so her grandfather's diary is a short of memoir that counts how he turned his page turned him back turned his back to his religion and his ancestor due to the primitive motivation of hunger so hunger was a compelling force that during rise of mine in 1866 caused this man to give up his religion and embrace christianity so how old were you hunted you turned coward and ran the real animal in you plunging through your bone you left your family behind the buried things the precious clot that praised the quality of a god so it's quite unsettling to say the least that a man is forced into conversion due to hunger so that is sort of inhumanity in it and you can wonder that how can a religion be so gross and materialistic to count the number of convertees to the promise of food rather than seeing people crying for food in the bellies so the tongue of diary is in vernacular and through language the diary conveys the cry of a man who was forced into doing something that must have caused him extreme pain and self reproach and then the cracked fallow earth ate into laughter of your flesh for you it was the hardest question of all dead empty dress stood by the dragging river past your weakened body flaying against your sleep so when one looks at the title of the poem there is an exception raised that perhaps it is some sentimental song for of love for someone passed by instead the song is one who has died long ago and the poet is deciphering things long past but yet terribly relevant what one can uh, see clearly is the politics of the world so doesn't care for the cries of the people and the imagery of the poem is what makes it uh, moving as it is like did you hear the young tamarind leaves rustle in the cold mean nights of your belly the so this quite pertinent and quite heart throbbing the imperishable that swung your broken body turned it inside out what did faith matter what hindu world so ancient and true for you to hold uneasily you dream towards the center of your mind so what does religion of faith matter in the end the body itself is unable to get even basic necessities in fact what religion is indeed you can question that it seems to have been transformed into a mere worship of god leaving aside the fact that people are starving and falling out on the way side so there's an entirely the sudden inhumanity that can be seen throughout the poem so her her grandfather his grandfather doesn't does manage to save his life through conversion but his heart is forever burdened by the deed that he has done 
So it's so it's a victim. You can say that. So neither his own religion nor the one he adopts is able to provide in the basic thing. Any religion should be that's providing comfort. That's the main motive of the religion is to provide solace and comfort and make the person quite filled with humanity and human nature must be inculcated in a person. But taking religion as a stride for uh, just counting numbers or the showing the majority and the minority is not the way the religion is to be. So. so this is a quite pertinent topic and even relevant today as well that how the people are running after just numbers not even not even concern about the major theme or the basic of what the religion speaks about or what the uh, divinity or the oneness of god says so it's just a mere politics or in the name of religion how the religion is itself a cultural inheritance that is transferred from one generation to other from one generation to another and the people try to try to play game or in name take the stride of politics in the name of religion and spoil or take advantage of the innocent people be it right or or they try to make the best of the situation or make the best out of for them in the difficult situation so this was in this poem that we can read it mm, then so we were discussing about uh, jayanta mahapatra's uh, yeah he uh, he is all about that we can say that he was being himself is quite authentic in his voice and uh, there's a uh, many pretensions of his voice of his time and uh, he has a beautiful attitude like a smile of a child and he welcomes was a welcome for all and have no shudder for his art and he is a another scale of thing that he's a philosopher who prefers to pen poetry rather than talk we can see we can see it from his work that everywhere the people talk of the desire for peace more than anything else in the world somewhere the urge to talk about oneself consumes the entire lifetime so there is somewhere a great poem i have to write so this was the poem that was written in 25th century 25th anniversary of our republic 1975 so he is a patient listener and a critical observer bestowed with a willing ear in choosing the subject of his poetry so being a physical science person man he belonged to the realm of physics but now he is a physical world copulated with the metaphysical imagery in his poetry so he is a quite successful he quite successfully portrays all the experiences and pathos like uh, he even voices the unvoiced find the echoes that finds voices in his poem and uh, there's a myth mysticism history there's a varied imagery that attains the utmost importance in his realm of poetry so he tries to manifest a sensibility that is molded by reckless innocence and his imagery flies keeping its feet deep rooted in the soil so his poem is a sort of communion a close observation of the region in and out and his poem normally oscillates between the tension of the language and expression uh, and is quite um, an assuming voice that talks shamelessly about the ground realities be it the physical hunger or the spiritual hunger that we notice in his poem and there's a different poem named hunger how the physical hunger is highlighted okay so this is the very ground reality that he normally speaks of and he weaves his experiences on the rap and web of the deep indian consciousness and his homeland becomes the hub of the literary works as we can see through the different works that he wrote that he has experienced experienced eyes doesn't let any cultural corner unvisited like the poems of hunger there's a there's a topics like hunger pain scars terrorism communalism dirty politics the screams of women paints his imagery the best thing about his reading is that uh, uh you never know what will turn up in the next phase so his consciousness is tethered to the belief that every happening has its consequence okay so this is believe that every happening has its consequence in what happened before so this his homeland being odisha It has been a quite paradoxical and contradict of pleasant and painful experiences for his life, and he hold a heart that can feel the hunger in stomach and the hunger between the legs. So this is the sort of personality that he is, that the eyes that he have, that vision, or the in-depthness that he has. 
so he has the eyes that can see the concern of aging prostitute and also the concern of a father of teenage girl so his poetry expresses love and concern for people of his homeland but he also feels the woe of the victims of union carbide in bhopal and even the forced martyrs of the khalistan in punjab all these poems gives a clue that the poetry when he says that my poem deals with a life within myself where the mind tries to find a sort of coherence from the mass of things in the world outside so jayanta mahapatra's poem is a kind of cross section of exotic culture and represent a socio cultural deterioration of the present generation and he even tries to go deep into the problem and he's concerned much about the present state of india and his poetry has a wide range and his thematic circle include both past present and its time meter his poetry is at once um, it encompasses history and it also gives a vision to future as well so he this makes him a polar star in the galaxy of indian english poet and it's broadly divided into two categories one is identify themselves with the landscape of a place and the contemporary india and on the other he tries to acclimatize the indigenous tradition of english language and jayanta mahapatra belong to both this category and it can't be denied that uh what makes this him familiar is he is absorbed in indianness and orissan identity yet exotic and more was the time uh, the the answer to the question can be found from the study of his poetry keeping this theme and varied imagery in mind and also keeping the historical forces behind it inside so the very concept the very topic that uh, we dealt with is the, the famine that was that took place in 1866 about the famine and how it had an impact upon the mindset of the people and how it was quite torturous and quite compelling on the individual and how the individual had to suffer the individual particularly the grandfather the tradition generation and how he is trying to carry that religion in the present situation as well so he tries to say that the jayanta mahapatra the first as a human being and as a child and a youth who witnessed a great period of transformation from the world war to the post independence communal violence was there and as an observer he feel, he can feel that pain of untimely death due to whether it's a cyclone in that or the thousands of death in bhopal due to the poisonous gas or be the assassination of gandhi or terrorism in punjab or kashmir so it's quite it would be an incomplete and insufficient without taking these into consideration his journey as a poet and as a human being and so his work john normally has a title of historical elements as an imagery as a sociological perspective that's a, that is pertinently seen in his poem so his objective can be uh, the, the objective can be found that um, there's varied imagery there's historical elements are there and as we discussed that historical and sociological perspective is a driving force behind poetic works of jayanta mahapatra and the reason behind the uh, the making of the poet or the how this poet pioneer or the what was considered the reason behind in being such an most read so one of the most renowned and right indian english poet of our time is jayanta mahapatra who is considered as one of the pioneer who set a unique trend in indian english poetry and his poem being written in english it carries the hallmarks of indian his poems are mostly woven around the local myth tradition landscape memoirs and chasan of time here while discussing the making of the poet researcher tries to place the poet and his work against the literary tradition of the time that he has inherited as well as the present which he himself crafted according to his own will giving shape to his own psyche transforming a trial into a highway for the future to come so frankly it can be seen that the compulsion while exploring the tertiary of the poet like him for example some of the lines that can be quoted is from the grandfather did you hear the young tamrin leaves rustle in the cold mean nights of your belly did you see your own death watch it tear at your cries break them into fits of unnatural laughter so this these lines can be comprehended in the vacuum you have to have the knowledge to relate okay so how grandfather lives and the great famine that took place in 1886 and other forms of the any any even can be related to the to this even but particularly it's 1886 of a mind that took place uh, so it would be a blunder to judge any text as an isolated work so every work has its historical background every work has a tradition that it follows and and it's it's quite normal that every text is text is in its textuality of historicity of a text or textuality of history is a most valid point that is behind a literary writing 
So Mahapatra began his career after getting completely ripe, or as some may say, a bit overripe. Uh, but this gave him a determination and edge to make a mark with a bang. Okay, so so it's uh, hard to be angle at angel at home. This short saying suits Jayanta Mahapatra. He is one of the poet who was appreciated and recognized abroad, and then at his home. So his work is widely appreciated outside India as well. Be it Southwest, many celebrated and well-known reviews like Canyon Review, Hudson Review, all these. Then Times Literary Supplement published his work frequently. So he has got featured even in a, a 10, 20th century Indian poets as well as the anthology that was edited by another well-known poet, R. Parthasarthi. He is also and also a writer's workshop anthology that is edited by Shiv Kumar. So he began late, and maybe this is one of the reasons behind his getting him published volumes and volumes in quick succession. So his poems are his soliloquies, his own perception regarding the self and the surrounding. He has chosen themes from both the inner and the outer world, and many themes are found to be repeated in the self, new tones and point of view in his work. So his poetry unravels a problem of his inner self as he tries to communicate the correlation of the self with the physical reality. So Jayanta Mahapatra was a professor of physics who jumped off his realm as a neotype after taking the great and old resolution as he wanted to do so for a long time of time. Perhaps it's a very Indian that we don't risk our secure place, but he did take the risk wholeheartedly. So English as a language always attracted him as much as mathematics and science. And uh, he also used to read books. But it was all to fight back his loneliness within his own secured corner at school and at house. He didn't read many poems except those which are included in his course during studies. Still, there are few poets like Robert Bly, another American tradition of the 60s and 70s, specifically the way he used the landscape at many times to talk like his very mouth, three mouthpiece expressing his subjective feelings. The romantic poets also had a tradition to be one with objects and surroundings and use nature as a stimuli to evoke emotions. So this is the reason that uh, many of his readers find few shades of romanticism in his poem as well. And his acquaintance with the works of uh, William Carroll, William and Ezra, Ezra Pound taught him to frame up a doctrine. A doctrine that poem is um, ultimately an inner voice. So its logic must be in relation with the inner world. And um, outer imagery and narrative are the tools to bridge both the worlds. He follows the method of uh, romantic poets to project external object to draw attention in the inner world. So though many critics find it obscure and uh, many things, this make him hard to understand. Like uh, in the poem that he says that I heard him say, my daughter, she has just turned 15. Feel her, I will be back soon. Your bus leaves at nine. The sky fell on me and a father exhausted wine. Long and lean her young were cold as rubber. She opened her warm legs wide and felt the hunger there. The other one, the fish littering, turning inside. So this is a pathetic situation that has been seen and it's quite a difficult one to read to the very depiction that he spoke on. So Mahapatra is uh, not unlike Ma Wordsworth, uh, doesn't have a spectacular view of things in nature and he holds a critical view of the nature. So for him, wind is not an innocent force that plays rustling leaves and creating golden currents in the wheat fields. Rather, his poem, in his poems called The Story at the Start of 1978, here he records how life and amenities have been blown away by the great cyclone that hit Orissa and Andhra coast in 1978, leaving a sad story of destruction. So it's quite different from the romantic poet. For him, nature is not that appealing or a fantastic pantheism sort of appeal to the nature, rather he tries to see the reality check of the nature. So love as a theme enters into some different uh, catenation at the side of his poetry. So he mixes it with different tones and texture, but largely remains unsatisfied and unfulfilled. So maybe the hand of the Adrian inside the folds of skirts of Irene still haunts him. Why not? She was one of the few lovely things in her life, but all too short. A desire was strangled to death soon after flowering. That is the reason he talks of love and sex together and freely. Most of his love poems, like Another Evening, Women in Love, The Warehouse in Calcutta Street, Armor, Love Fragment, Of That Love Lost, and few others uh, carry nostalgic treatment, as Mahabhatra puts it, like in Lost, Of That Love, Of That Mile Walk Together in the Rain, On a Weary Remains, 
years have passed and I, since I sat with you watching this guy go lonely with cloudlessness, waiting for your body to make it not in. So many critics even like uh, Vijay Kumar Das have told that he talks about love and sex freely in an effort to get over disappointment and failures in them. And he also introduces physical hunger or the need of physical consumption in love through his subtle imagery. On the one of the trends that were brought by Western civilization in the 19th century was to see history with a wide and wide panorama. So new horizons of the knowledge widen the outlook, the way one sees the history. It was the transitional period, a period of dilemma between uh, roots and new tradition. So there was not any facet of life which uh, remained untouched by the Western influence. The new voices that emerged after independence was influenced by the 20th century because they Hopkins, Yeats, Eliot, Pound, Auden. So literature itself liberated itself from the nationalistic, patriotic, political idioms and emphasis shifted its center to personal desires and discontent from mythological characters of religion. So this may be called a period of uh, new speciation or for the Indian and English poetry as it found a way between ancient roots and uh, blind imitation of the borrowed culture. So past and present were copulated to produce a progeny having the hereditary of past and variation of modernism. So the poets were no longer a citizen of imaginative galaxy, but became a layman facing and witnessing the ground realities and reflecting a consciousness of community life. So modern poetry, which was in that only to European tradition, due to its monovision, gradually grew and became multidimensional in terms of receiving world literary traditions like America, and uh, friends, poetry traditions. At the same time, it is also increased in depth and enrooted firmly, giving due spot to its old and regional literary tradition. So post-independence Indian poetry began designing itself by kind of liberalization and globalization policy. It kept its ears open for all and became critical in choosing the themes and techniques. So Mahapatra busied himself in writing regional poetry, northeastern poets like uh, Anjum Hassan, Robin, Nagangom, and this and, and poems of Pablo Neruda, Joyanta Mahapatra were deeply influenced by surrealists. So the Indian English poetry gained a very apparent contemporary outlook and uh, shifted focus from religion and musing to the harsh realities. So the poets uh, became autobiographical and they have their own story to relate with others. So Jayanta Mahapatra speaks on the change that was apparent. However, it was in the 80s and early 90s that a change was seen in much of the English poetry written in India. So the discerning reader no longer wanted to read merely a well-crafted poem of the Indian poet in English, a poem which could have come as well from a pen of a poet living in America or Britain or Australia. Neither was the poet interested only in the dry wit and irony most English poets exhibited. The prevailing poetry scene was witnessing a subtle change. Poets, young poets from various parts of the country were coming out with their poems. Suddenly English poems were being written differently in Kerala, be it Kerala, Northeast or in Odisha. So they tried to co contextualize the poems to the particular situation. So it was not about all the ways of writing, but it was the content of what they wrote about. So poetry grew out its roots from the earth and the poet inhabited, manifested his belongings to the land. So this was sort of attachment that they tried to relate it to the one's land, uh, very groundedness. So the poem who tries to study them in isolation is quite, would be quite puzzling and it will quite seem obscure. So making it a point while reading Mahapatra's poem, taking into account the Hindu, the very social relation and the language can't be separated and it, it won't be quite making any sense if we try to Takes the text as it is, but we need to take the text by taking into account the very social political background into account. So, Mahapatra has realized the reason for the failure of the earlier Indian English poetry. So, he openly declares that uh, he proposes to frankly, I should like to write such poetry, a poetry which comes out of ashes of our culture. As he writes in Ash's poem, uh, the dead man who lick my palms is more likely to encourage my dark intolerance rather than turn me towards some strange, strangely solemn shroud. So Indian English literature to the larger extent has uh, remained even today to reach only to elite classes of society, as it happened already to the ancient Sanskrit literature, but not like Sanskrit links up to the whole country. Now, so it has got future potential in itself. 
the poets who employ english as a medium of expression came from different cultural background and community so it's quite apparent that their works carry the poster of the re- regional textures a uh, sense of being rooted in particular soil the aroma of the local culture and the way uh, gives poet a sense of ease while describing it to the others like w b eats had put it in his own way in the following lines like uh, in the under ben burden he wrote that uh, many times man lives and dies between his two eternities that of race and that of soul an ancient island knew it all well so this can be related to how the indian poetry took itself out of the shadows of the trees which sheltered it in a brooding state and slowly it got more and more mature by adding regional linguistic identity of the land so indian poetry presented a fusion of past and future it kept its ear open for new lore and at the same time it secured a special place in the heart of the locality in the form of regional cultural communities and jayawan jayanta mahapatra is one of the champions of such fusions so for him there can be not a song of india as india which lies in orissa is different from that of punjab and kashmir and gujarat so whenever poets insist to be universal or general for all actually the one is risking his own very identity so any literary work and writer cannot free himself from the burden of his own past so his identification with orissa can be easily seen in his it's a hallmark you can say there's a genuine mark that one can say this found in his work so he often plunges in history takes out something from its cavity and he regenerates a part into his narrative so local history of orissa is evident in his poems uh, orissa previously known as udradesh and later as utkal as kalinga this mentioned that mentioned even in mahabharata sadva prabha bishma prabha and bana prabha parva so mahapatra's belonging to the land took him to way back in 220 260 bc to pen few lines of his ancestors who became martyrs at the hand of the armies of ashok so though ashok um, had given up the violence and accepted buddhism but it didn't alter the pain of those slain in the war right so dhaulagiri the war that was the measure of ashok's suffering doesn't appear in of the place of his pain peers lamently from among the pains of death so join the being a meek and a shy child burden with responsibility belonging to stone christian mother and living in an area dominated by hindu ritual hindu rituals and cultures lost his children in growing alienation and wait for better men as he writes in his opening lines of his autobiography he says that there is invariably a lot of pain in childhood i remember mine and all of it seems so long ago yet the pain or whatever i chose to call it today faces quietly behind the breast so patra became a silent observer there are many chinks in the fence around him and he could see that it butterflies carried by ants his loneliness at school brought him to books he tried to find some loveliness in one of his classmate irene till one fine day he saw one boy having his hand inside her skirt so he was at one point defiant with mother and there was a chasm between them and none of them ever tried to bridge it through talk so he slipped into some cozy corners and covered himself with uh, self pity as a scape from unfavorable surroundings so sitting hours long on the roof or house my hands clasped around my knees watching the pale moon coming in with a handful of lights that fail to reach the deep corners of my existence so those pains which were so invariable hold an invariable hold a strong place in his poems as many of his poems are remembrance of those days so the darkness of life made him absorb all the moon lonely women moon river and even the whole atmosphere and later he allowed them to be dominant characters in his poetry even so these are the few images which seems to be quite uh, frequent in his poems he uses images to make him make his silent assert in loud whispers so he never tried to glorify anything on contrary present a naked body of dark with the and skinny realities of time so, so in this poem the, his grandfather like Moss Eaton Diary took him to the year of 1866 when the worst famine struck Odisha. His teenager grandfather took shelter in relief camp run by British. There was no food. Man starved to death. Hunger made them devour on tender tamarind leaves. Few used unknown roots and tubers to quench the fire burning inside, but in turn only got typhoid and cholera infections. His grandfather survived in Morsi camp, but they bargained his religion. Religion has always remained a dilemma and a taboo in the life of Mahapatra. He always found himself in the middle of hostile flow of religions. 
way away from banks both the sides he brought up in religion hindu surrounding he completed his masters in patna watching the ganga hindu festivities celebrations temples and rituals found a special place in his poetry and he was fascinated for he has a fascination for hindu way of thing but he kept a safe distance from it and as he writes that i was at the center of it all trying to communicate with both and probably becoming myself incommunicable as a result through years so the arrays of hindu religious festivals find a respective place in him idol worship or temple bells priest always fascinated his imagery so going through his poem one can easily find that no christian symbols finds place in his work as he says that he has always been conscious of his grandfather's cry tearing the air So Jyotir Mahapatra still finds still finds himself unwelcome despite his preoccupation with Hinduism. He has never been accepted into the system. Now he also prefers to be a neutral outsider, watching the blind faith, custom, rituals, in which to share with them their tradition. So undoubtedly he has maneuvered himself with themes, myths, myths, tradition of Orissa, but that doesn't make him holding the narrow view of the things related to particular religion. Religion. So he has witnessed great period of transformation, both social, religious, and literary continuation. So he witnessed British rule and also the struggle for liberation. He has seen the rise of Gandhi and also the assassination of Gandhi in his poetry turns into imagery of hero glorifying fighting alone. So Gandhi's death led to emotional outburst from sensible heart all over the globe, and Mahapatra had his share in the emotional comment we have burst. Open his blood. So this was a quotation or the line that he told. So Gandhi being an icon, old man, as one of the recurring image in his poem. So at the same time, the communal clash in the country, be it terrorism in Kashmir and Punjab, also made him pen few poems. The oral tradition that Mahapatra carries with him originally belongs to Oriya poetry, as that of Bengal, and can be easily tracked back to Charia songs. The Charia songs were the religious verse, verses. Of Sahaja Sahaja, these are a sect of Mahama Mahayana Buddhism. So we find this in Mahapatra's English poem, a little of the folk qualities of Sarala Dal, and he might have adopted from Oriya literature the interest in the landscape of Orissa, its culture, tradition, and unique Jagannath cult. But despite his regional predisposition, there is much that speaks of English influence in him. His love for English germinated due to personal reasons, but uh, English played the role of his survival and also his conditioning for. future he is a he was aware of the modern and experimental poetry that came to literary sense through pens of ramanuja kamala das uh, nizamul zikr and uh, kolatkar nandi and others some of these poems he had translated but these poems did not have any direct influence on him rather uh, i he says i gave him them him a kind of parallel evolution he witnessed some of the movements like impressionism post impressionism expressionism cubism symbolism imagism vorticism designism so these as we have discussed earlier all these failed to influence him directly rather they played a role in his evolution and growth so mahapatra didn't remain uninfluenced by change that uh, took place in india in the form of urbanization rather he depicts the hissing of the kitchen the screech of the play house the swindlers the slurred robbers hoods as in the following lines of the can we see that the neighbors neighbors the newly rich silver smith the vegetable seller a pasty faced school teacher and kamla three rupee were from my mother's remote village with the old hard tradition so this was on the 25th anniversary for republic 1975 so surrealism that arrived as a new change between two decades separating the world wars this term was introduced by gillian apoliner who believed in super realism or as it was explained by andrew britton first manifesto of surrealism as the mind liberated from the chain of logic and reason so mahapatra was speci- specially influenced by surrealism as it is evident from his essay that is published in the literary criterion in the essay
Yes, sir. So, so we were uh, talking about the how the uh, the way the things was going on and how he tried to represent the things, how the surrealist aspect has taken place and the very reality of reality tried to influence him and the different uh, revolution that was took place. Just it was a sort of evolution that created on him. So, um, so he had uh, so there was a quotation right. Um, how old I was, I asked myself, nine perhaps, but was it at this point in my life that my love and respect for all things English began to grow? Or was it a part of my conditioning, my program for survival? So just John the used to spend his uh, long lunch breaks at school with some books, and other boys were all tall and strongly built and brutal. So he preferred books in the library. One day and he was caught to by a few boys bigger than him. So this they brutally, they brutally dragged him to the teacher's desk and naked him to see how young he was. So this incident has already remained in the back of his mind. And whenever he talked about sexual sexual brutality, he himself described his agony and pain in his words. So the agony of that afternoon, he has never ceased or left me. So why, why were they so cruel? I have asked myself this question again and again. So naked my eyes shut to hide my shame. Those boys must have seen that I was really the young boy. I confessed I was, I'm not the dwarfish creature that had made me out to me. my balance seemed lost i had been stripped down to the wound of sex so his uh so 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 this was a brutal situation or the cruel situation that he was made a part of so his so he he has a location or house in Qatar, and that's located at the end of the clustered houses that's made up of mostly clay walls and straw roofs belonging to poorer people who had to dug water well and drink water so his father used to work at a steel factory and he was a sub-inspector at the primary school. So his earning was comparatively mere. So Jayanta was the eldest son and father work kept hard uh, him, kept him away from school. So he had responsibility bearing. Okay. So there was no one to talk or the younger brother and were merely four. So there was there were there was a tall deodors that used to tease his alienation and develop a kind of fear in him. So maybe this sort of alienation sowed the seed of observing the society and landscape in him. That many times he had lost to sit inside the room in darkness, staring the evening from inside. So silence had become a recognizable part of his life. So it was a kind of education for him. So then the one, the one of the best part of the session would be the, how the, his relation with the mother and the father would be a quite uh, defe defeating point that could be discussed here. So Jayanta Mahapatra has a strange relationship with his mother. So his father used to work constantly and he was quite away from home and being his uh, eldest son, he had to bore the sort of responsibility. So he never felt the kind of affinity what he felt for his father or his mother. So he spent most of the time in home, but they hardly talk and he remained absorbed with his alienation surrounding and society waiting eagerly for his father's presence. So his mother was quite erratic in her ways and she, um, he and he grew up like conflicts with her increases. So she was shrewd, ingenious, believing in anything she heard. And she believed even a total stranger, but not him. So mother's ranting went on. And according to her, something had not gone her way. And he put, and he never put in any effort to explain his behavior. So she filled all her thoughts and all acts into two closed drawers of her life for right and wrong. And he was flushed with a constant tension. So he kept himself to himself only. So mother didn't appear to have any trust to him so it was difficult to agree with her and at times he questions himself was my only fault in not making myself clear about my own actions as he writes the door was in front of me and i was the key but i didn't try to unlock it so this was his way of thinking about the relationship that he had with his mother so in spite of all the differences mahapatra could feel the pain and agony of women inside her mother the picture of his mother swathed in sari holding the oil lamp in the shadows, the suri train swaying in the breeze, seemed to establish itself firmly in his mind. He could see an inexplicable loneliness linked with the sad eye old oil lamp of mother. He also felt the same numbing and pity for his cousin who was battered by frequent beating from a drunken husband. So he himself agrees here that this is a kind of training to understand the symbols without going inside very deep. So he used this image to his life in his many poems later even. And his relationship with father that uh, he was much closer to his father's compared to his mother and his father being was working as a steel factory at the tata city so he also 
as a part time sub inspector in primary school his income was not enough but and go kept him away from home so father actions made him quite poor and he took extra responsibilities of home and he was quite uneasy with his mother so he waited eagerly as we have told earlier even so there were stories to listen in the uneven darkness his father used to say few secrets of things and little anecdotes of their life so he wanted to hear them again and again but uh, above it all his father instilled in him a new courage and wash of the darkness and silence within him so after marriage at a point of time he had to left his parental house even due to growing in differences between his mother and the and his spouse so though he took the great resolution for the sake of his wife bruno that he left his parental home as well and but he he saw his father dying inch by inch for 5 years there was no long talks or no stories but they could understand each other silence well so and we would like to quote this line from him that uh, it took 3 long years for the end to come and i saw the dignity erode the year born out day by day something died before the greenness went we watched each other in silence the day i sat beside him we didn't talk anymore was it both of the wind and of my father have made the words of many of my poems and lastly i would like to add some of the points regarding the odisha and its landscape the raps and Webs of his poetry are based on Odisha ground, and he cannot be judged and analyzed and comprehended, keeping his home land aside. So, be it legends, myth, history, landscape, they act as the epicenter of his poetic realm. So he becomes the very embodiment. His poems is the embodiment of land, temples, festivals, streets, and landscape. And he himself declared that to Odisha, to this land in which my roots lies, and lies my past, and in which lies my beginning and my end. and the poem that we today read that it so we can again just to wind through the wind up session we can just add few more lines that we can say that one evening during his brief visit to home his father brought out an old tattered notebook from somewhere he watched him as he opened the book and pointed to all the yellow first page as he himself described the moment in his own words the oria has but on the page was difficult to read the letters were in a script mostly used by rural unlettered folk father pointed at the writing again and said simply your grandfather's soon what father wanted to convey to us became clear so that ancient little diary is a kind of raw record of his grandfather's life so in, in the year 1866 that was a devastating famine that had struck odisha english who ruled the country made efforts for food supply to provide but it was all futile as his grandfather's village was unsuited in a remote was suited but suited in a remote village area where road facilities were but not available so people devoured even the soft leaves of the tamarind so many tried to quench their hunger by by eating some unknown roots and tubers so and these in turn caused epidemics like the four type of cholera so thousands of people died even and no one bothered for the dead bodies even so they were released into the rivers to be devoured by equally starving chuckles and vultures so his grandfather was nearly 17 and was in a state of collapse so he staggered into the morsi camp run by poi christian missionaries in katak so where he had to embrace a new religion urged by baptist so jayanta mapata notes that in i could imagine grandfather the thin callow youth he must have been walking the still unmade parts of the land the long hot afternoon floating down into the pit of his stomach as death made him stretch his emaciated hands out into the unknown So and into this camp, his grandfather found a girl Rupabati, who had been brought into this camp forcibly to complete the number. As one of the child was found missing, uh, years later, his grandfather got married to her. So they must have been a devoted couple. They were now staunch Christian. They have got six children. The youngest of them was Lemuel, Janda's father. Uh, name may be given by white missionaries. So they grew up into. two was the first was home where they were subjected to rigid question of pilgrimage with rules his mother least sternly imposed and the other was a vast dominant hindu amphitheater of the pilgrimages of rites and festivals which uh, represented the way of life for the people was so that tone the 
uh, the tone and moth eaten diary is one of the most prized possessions for him it is a history memory and communication the very scroll of despair which made him to write one of his poem grandfather uh, the yellow diary notes was put in vernacular the sound of forgotten posture the cramped cry that forces me to hear the voice now i stumble in your black faced world so jayant baba to insist an anecdote of his life by saying that today my brother is a faithful christian a leader of the local community i am not i hear grandfather's cry welling back tone in the air so there are different factors time and history that influence the particular writing or the workmanship that he wrote so this was all about jayant mahapatra's grandfather the poem that he wrote with reverberating themes and and even relevant in the present context as well so thank you sir thank you any more suggestions or the questions that could be welcomed actually thank you very much you have really deconstructed the poem in your eloquent style there is nothing more to it you not only talked about the poem grandfather but also about the life of jayant mahapatra how he related history into the contemporary politics and different musings on his life and there is no doubt that jayant mahapatra genius poetic genius reflected in this poem which he could weave out from brittle and mothic in notes so thank you very much and thank you sir for listening thank you sir amit sir can we wind up the session yes ma'am anil ma'am would you like to say something ananya ma'am are you here Yes, yes, Heba. I'm here. I joined it uh, a bit late, but uh, nevertheless, your presentation was very beautiful. And uh, one more thing, I would like to say uh, to the technical uh, support here uh, that uh, from today onwards, I think Anshuman sir has sent a message, and from today onwards, uh, you know, the messages will be sent to the students uh, timely. and uh, hopefully in the next from the next class we will have a uh, good amount of students and uh, this session uh, could be i think we can if you will to heba then you may take another class in this session because it's a very beautiful poem and the way you have portrayed it is even more beautiful so we can do that and uh, yeah that's it for today and it was a beautiful session thank you so much Thank you, ma'am. Thank you to one and all for helping us to promote this session, and thanks to one and all. Thank you, technical team and the um, professor Patil Pawan sir for actively participating in the session and making the session much more interactive. Thanks, thanks to one and all.